Thesis Gate. Two more high profile Taiwanese politicians are brought down by academic fraud. How an imaginative Taiwanese design is changing the lives of Syrian refugees. I'm Ed Moo for Taiwan Plus, and today I'm here in Taipei, where hundreds of people have come out in support of protesters in China. And Vancouver's Jade Music Festival wrapped up this past weekend. Taiwan Plus catches up with Hakka singer Huang Yuhan to learn more. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Andrew Ryan. Taiwan's interior minister has announced that he's stepping down due to health reasons. Xu Guoyong tendered his resignation to Premier Su Zhenchang on Monday. Sources say Xu suffers from chronic medical conditions such as asthma and spinal issues. His resignation comes amid reports of a possible cabinet reshuffle and after the ruling Democratic Progressive Party suffered several high-profile defeats in the recent local elections. Premier Su conveyed his sympathies and said he hoped Xu would be able to keep working with the government in some capacity. Two candidates in a key by-election race in Taipei are locked in a row over links between politics and organized crime. Wang Hongwei of the opposition Guomindang says her opponent, Enoch Wu, harbored gangsters when he was the ruling party's local chief. But Wu says that's not true. Stash Butler has the story. Enoch Wu is a rising star of Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party and its candidate for lawmaker in a tightly fought Taipei seat. The by-election vote in January will be a key test for the party after a bruising defeat in last month's local elections. And for Wu, it could be the job that launches him into national politics. But he's facing scandal on the way there. The opposition says Wu protected people with ties to gangs when he was the ruling party's Taipei chief, an accusation Wu denies. He says he sacked two party officials for their ties to organized crime. But one of those officials says Wu did no such thing. Now the opposition Guomindang candidate is calling for an explanation. Wu is standing by his version of the story, but the row comes at a difficult time for his party. The ruling Democratic Progressive Party lost control of two northern cities in last month's elections and failed to win Taipei. Taiwan's premier says his party will do better. But the issue of organized crime in politics goes further than the ruling party alone. In the 80s and 90s, after Taiwan became a democracy, gangs used local politicians to promote their interests. Cleaning up government since then has been a long and drawn-out process. Politics in Taiwan now is far more transparent than it was. But the row between Enoch Wu and Taiwan's opposition shows the muddy ties between gangs and government are still pertinent enough to draw the focus of a campaign. Damon Lin and Stash Butler for Taiwan Plus. More high-profile politicians are being exposed for plagiarism in their academic works. This comes a little over a week after local elections in Taiwan, which saw political attacks on candidates' academic ethics. Over the weekend, two universities revoked the degrees of high-profile politicians. Bing Wang has more. After an extensive thesis review, two more prominent members of the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, are brought down by academic fraud. This, in addition to a slew of other politicians across the political spectrum who were recently accused of similar fractions. Stripped of the degrees less than three weeks after the local elections, Zheng Wenchan, the current mayor of the northwestern city of Taoyuan, and Tsai Siying, a legislator from the major port city of Jilong, who ran a losing campaign for mayor last month. National Taiwan University, the country's leading institution, 
revoked both politicians' degrees for plagiarizing their thesis. One of the highest profile members of the DPP, Zhen couldn't run for re-election after serving two terms as mayor of Taoyuan, and was expected to seek a higher position within the party. Lin Zijian, the DPP candidate who ran to replace Zheng, was forced to withdraw from the race after both his master's degrees were revoked over plagiarism. And as plagiarism scandals pile up, attention is turning to the person who served as thesis advisor to both Zheng and Ling, National Security Bureau Director General Chen Mingtong. There are calls for a thorough investigation into all the academic works where Chen served as an advisor. Chen Mingtong can consider first to go to the university, but the in recent years, politicians have been attacking each other over their academic records, which are seen as a way to judge their intelligence and integrity. The country's premier, Susan Tsang, has added his voice to the call for more investigations. The local elections may be over, but the allegations of academic fraud will continue. Going forward, politicians can expect their educational background to come under as much scrutiny as their policy platforms. Patrick Chen and Bing Wang for Taiwan Plus. Taiwanese architect Chiu Zhenyu has won awards for his design of a center helping Syrian refugees living in Turkey. As Rick Glauert reports, the center has been a big win for Taiwan diplomacy, and it's given Cho a unique opportunity to share his vision of a better world. In a small town in southeastern Turkey, a refuge for people fleeing the war in Syria, the Taiwan Center. Taiwanese architect Cho Zhenyu designed this building using blocks of Turkey's border wall with Syria, which lies just kilometers away from the town. The war, not for separating the people, the war is for creating a place to share by everyone. And that is the town around the center. We use the military war and convert into humanitarian facility. The war previously separated the people. Now we use the same war, bring everyone together and work together and we'll survive together. The striking concrete and metal structure has won awards for its innovative design. It pays homage to Syrian architecture and uses repurposed materials. It was completed with a budget of just one million US dollars. 52 spaces can house classrooms, shops, cafes, and artist studios for the refugees. And the center has become an important landmark in a town coming to terms with the influx of new residents from its war-torn neighbor. So we are a community. We building a building together, and by building a building together, we build a real community, and we trust with each other. And this is the meaning of the architecture. Another obstacle for Cho building the center with funds from and naming it after Taiwan. Under pressure from China, Taiwan is shut out from international organizations, including United Nations agencies and other major humanitarian groups. For Cho, the center, now three years old, is not just a building. It is a manifestation of his vision for a better world. Here, the refugees create artworks and products which they can sell to other countries, such as Taiwan. When he's back home, Cho also shares the lessons he has learned with others, including with students around the country. 
Charles Taiwan Center is a vivid example of how, despite the difficulties, Taiwan can help humanitarian efforts abroad. Now he's working with the next generation and hoping to inspire them to be more proactive on the world stage. It was the students at Dayuan International Senior High School in northern Taiwan that invited Chou to come speak at their school. Now they hope to launch an exchange program with Syrian children at the Taiwan Center. By uh, listening to Joe's story, like, we can uh, know that we have the chance and opportunity and source that we can help others and help the people at the other side of the world. So after seeing Cho done something, um, I hope I really hope I can uh, visit there and also in the future maybe I can do something to um, like push Taiwan into a uh, international stage. But for Cho, doing his part to tackle the refugee crisis is not just about showing what Taiwan can do. It's about empathizing with human suffering and doing his best to help. I know one day people from Taiwan will be respected from the world community, not because we come from Taiwan. It is because we know how to help the people around the world. People will see the hope. That is the respect for Taiwan come from. You taking care of the life around you. So people taking care of the people from Taiwan. And that is the only solution the real respect, the real humanity. That's what I believe. It is everyday people that pay the highest cost for conflicts around the world, like the war in Syria. But Cho and his Taiwan Center are showing that people, regardless of background or nationality, can find the humanity, compassion and ingenuity to alleviate some of that suffering. Andy Shue, Pichi Chuang and Rick Lauert for Taiwan Plus. Hundreds of people in Taiwan have rallied to show their support for protests in China against that country's strict zero COVID policies. Taiwan Plus's Ed Moon was at the rally in Taipei to find out more about why they're supporting what's become known as the A4 revolution. Last week saw thousands of people take to the streets in China in the biggest mass demonstrations against Communist Party rule since the 1989 Tiananmen protests. And today, here in Taipei, hundreds of people have come out to show their support. It's come to be known as the A4 revolution, a wave of protest that spread across China last week, demanding an end to the harsh lockdowns and daily testing that have become a factor of life under the country's strict zero COVID policy. Though small, this Taipei rally is meaningful. Among those attending are representatives from Taiwan, Hong Kong and the Uyghur communities, all of whom have experienced oppression from Beijing. Taiwanese are threatened regularly with military force by China, which views the country as part of its territory. While Hong Kong has seen its freedoms curtailed and the Uyghur people from China's western Xinjiang region have been subject to what the UN has described as serious human rights violations. This place is called Freedom Square a name it earned after Taiwan's successful transition to democracy. All the people gathered here today have one hope, that one day people in China will have the same freedom as those here in Taiwan. 
Several Chinese cities have begun easing COVID-related restrictions in the wake of protests against China's strict approach. Movie theaters are reopening in the central city of Zhengzhou, where residents will no longer have to show a negative test result to take public transport and visit parks. The city is home to Foxconn's iPhone plant, which was rocked by unrest last month over restrictions. China is still holding fast to its zero COVID policy, but it appears to be reacting to public frustration over lockdowns and mass testing. Urumuchi, the capital of the country's Xinjiang region, is reopening shopping malls, markets and restaurants from Monday. The city has been under lockdown for more than three months. China is operating a global network of more than 100 overseas secret police stations. That's according to a new report. Human rights group Safeguard Defenders says it recently discovered the existence of 48 international outposts run by Chinese security authorities. That's in addition to the 54 such stations that an earlier report found operating around the world. The reports say the facilities are used to monitor, harass and re repatriate Chinese citizens living abroad. Safeguard Defenders also says that over 200,000 people were forcibly returned to China in just one year. Chinese authorities have denied that they run secret police stations on foreign soil. For more on the findings, our reporter Ryan Ho Kilpatrick spoke with the lead author of the report, Laura Harth. Your report has nearly doubled the number of known overseas police stations run by Chinese public security authorities. But has it also shed more light on what it is exactly they do? Yes, so our report doubled the numbers. We found 48 additional declared stations. And I do wish to highlight that these are the stations public security bureaus from local provinces, counties in China talk about themselves. Uh, so that's very important to highlight. There might be more. What the report looks into further, which is our main goal interest, is to look how these stations are involved in transnational repression and policing activities on behalf of Chinese authorities. So we did find additional evidence that for these two new jurisdictions that we discovered, uh, that they were involved in such persuasion to return operations, which are completely illegal. We found one uh, in particular for the Wenzhou stations coming from Paris in France and declared at least 80 of such illegal operations carried out through the Nantong stations. Beijing has said that these stations were set up in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to help their citizens who were essentially trapped in these foreign countries at the time. But what do your findings reveal about this explanation? Well, it is clear that Beijing needs to get its own timeline uh, right. You cannot tell two falsehoods and, and, and make them ha become a truth. Um, so both Wenzhou and, and Nantong started setting up these stations according to their statements as early as 2016. Uh, and we already know from the previous report that Xinjiang started setting these up in 2018. So unless Beijing and these or these local authorities knew something that the rest of the world didn't, that just does not add up. Let me also add that those so-called consular services run through the stations are in severe violation of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Um, many countries have called this out already. They are illegal. You cannot set up these kind of services, even if they're useful, without the consent of the host government. And you're joining us uh, right now from Italy, which is the country where you found the most of these overseas stations, and yet it's not taken any action against them yet or even um, launched an investigation. So why do you think that is? We reveal in the report how it seems clear that these kind of bilateral policing cooperation agreements, such as the one that Italy has with the PRC, with the Ministry of Public Security, which is obviously plurally accused of crimes against humanity and even assisting in genocide, uh, in China, how these kind of agreements have directly contributed, have been used or abused uh, to set up these clandestine uh, stations, which is but the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we've revealed this on other countries as well. Why does Italy and other countries not react to this? Um, it beats me, to be honest. It must be clear to governments, and, and I'm grateful that we've seen a strong response from 13 governments so far since we released 
our first report in, in September, but governments need to understand this is a domestic threat. This is an attack on fundamental freedoms and human rights, the rule of law everywhere. Um, Italy is a G7 country. It's a European member state. Uh, it's high time it, it acts on these. And we hope that this latest report with new revelations will make it do so. Again, that was our reporter, Ryan Ho Kilpatrick, speaking with Laura Harth of Safeguard Defenders. Taiwanese Hakka singer Huang Yuhan was invited to perform in Vancouver at the recent Jade Music Festival. Our reporter, Yvonne Yang, spoke to Huang about her trip to Canada and what she wants to tell the world through her Hakka language songs. Um, your latest album is called Story Power. Could you tell us the story about you and your music? And why do you choose to write in Hakka? 其实我小时候有练过古典钢琴那时候就觉得对弹唱这件事蛮有兴趣的然后到后来高中开始接触木吉他之后在大学进入这个大学的木吉他弹唱比赛之后开始接触创作然后有一次是在比赛过程当中我
to get a taste of how Christmas is celebrated in Germany. I feel like the German Christmas markets tend to have like a better reputation or are more popular. So also having German friends, this one was highly recommended to us. And I think it's quite clearly what, it's quite clearly evident as to why like there's great representation of German culture here. The market was also a wonderful opportunity for young children to enjoy the festive fun with their families. For some visitors, the event even reminded them a bit of home. Uh, so we are from Germany, so um, yeah, that's actually why we came. So it's, yeah, it's very similar to, a little bit similar to what we would get in Germany. So we like that a lot and it's, it's very nice, like the pretzels and the different beers. It reminds me of home. <laughs> But yeah, the weather is really not like in Germany, <laughs> so that's different. It's just the beginning of December, but the crowd here are already embracing the festive spirit. And as it gets closer to Christmas, the celebrations are for sure to be in full swing. Leon Lian, Pi Chi Chuang and Sandy Yi Chi for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Remember to download the Taiwan Plus app for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally, today we leave you with some images of endangered monarch butterflies traveling up to 3,000 kilometers from the eastern United States and Canada to spend the winter in Mexico. Sounds great to me. I'm Andrew Ryan. Stay, take care and we'll see you next time.